Good evening, and welcome to this week's Engender Live. I'm Natalie Washington, uh, and you'll be pleased to hear that last time went so well that we're doing this all again for you. Uh, so it may be transfer deadline day today, uh, but I'm more than happy with the squad I've got at my disposal. Uh, with, so we're fielding an unchanged team this week. Uh, so today you'll be seeing Rachel Evans. Hello, good evening. Lisa Seven. Hi. Charlotte McCarroll. Hey. And a special guest, uh, Olivia, who's with Charlotte today. So we thought Hi. we'll allow you to get in on the act as well. Thanks. So um, what have we got for you today? So hopefully... If, if the technology has gone well, boy, we've got a Q&A that you can actually send us questions this week. I'm really hoping that's working. If it's not, um, or if you choose to use an alternative method, then you can tweet us at n underscore gender, so that's at n underscore g-e-n-d-r, um, uh, and you can interact with us this way. So we'll be discussing a couple of topics, um, so if you've got anything you want to weigh in on that, or if there's anything you want to talk about, or you want us to discuss, uh, then throw some questions our way. Um, Anyway, so our first topic, um, rather an obvious one this week for our UK-based trans people, but it's been really big news here. Um, so this is the news about Charing Cross Gender Identity Clinic allegedly closing, but of course we know it's not actually closing, so I know you panic. Um, but yeah, interesting topic. So um, Rachel, do you want to kick us off on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Uh, so this was uh, news that I think was kicking off on the, I think it was Wednesday last week or what, Thursday or something, recently. And uh, it, it was quite fast moving. There was, it started off with um, a, a press release by uh, Western Mental Health Trust, but then rapidly uh, sort of seemed to get out of control with a story by Gay Star News uh, saying that the uh, the GIC was going to close, which was not something that was actually contained in the press release itself. Uh, so there's obviously questions there over whether that was a very responsible thing to do, because if nothing else, and I don't know how the ins and outs of how, uh, how NHS services are actually run, so I, I can only speak as a, as a user of those services, as I'm sure many of us are, um, is that stories like this have to uh, they inevitably spread doubt and fear and worry. Uh, and of course, for many people using those services at GIC, that's the last thing you need. You're already so concerned with with the reason that you're going to services in the first place. The last thing you need is someone spreading doubt about whether the service is even going to continue to be there in the first place. So this was a really unhelpful story by Gay Star News. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I think Charlotte, you were telling us before we went live that. There's You've got some experience of, of a service that something similar has happened, so I don't know. Maybe you could fill us in on what you think might so, happen there. So basically, the thing with a lot of NHS services is the NHS is very broken up. There's a lot of trusts, there's foundations, there's even some private companies already running things. And for a patient at point of use, that has no effect on anything whatsoever. So, as an example of a hospital in Glasgow. It's incredibly efficiently run. It's probably a, a flagship example in the entire UK. So it's primarily cardiac and orthopedic hospital. It's called the Golden, G Golden Jubilee Hospital in Glasgow. And it's run by a private foundation, the Jubilee Foundation. So if you have a heart attack in Glasgow, you get rushed up there, you get gold star treatment, but you don't pay for it. It's still NHS for that point of use. So for the Charing Cross GIC, just to say that London, West London Mental Health Trust is no longer going to run it doesn't mean it's going to shut. It just means it's open for tender by another trust or foundation or other company. Uh, and for patients, at point of use, it's still going to be free. And in any uh, case, I'm uh, hoping. Sorry. Uh, in any case, there were clarifications later on by by Stuart Lorimer of the, of the GIC and then from the uh, GIC's press office themselves. Uh, saying uh, exactly that, that, that they're not closing uh, and that they, they were simply serving notice on the contract so that another provider could be found. Um, and, and once you've ignored the Gay Star News spin on it, or what well, I say spin is probably being generous, inaccuracies and, and, and misinformation, um, the story does actually sound, to be honest, fairly positive because cause it sounded well, yeah, like uh, exactly. there was something in there around um, the, the GIC chose to do this because they, they didn't want to be, they didn't think it was appropriate to be uh, to be operating under a mental health unit because yeah, most that, of the clients do not have mental health problems. 
Also, mm -hmm. one of the uh, reasons cited was um, simply the, the the increased influx of patients and the the, the uh, mental health trust felt that they couldn't um, couldn't meet that need anymore, and and therefore submitting their notice to to end the contract. So this is an opportunity for somebody else, another trust or foundation or whoever wins the tender to hopefully improve the services, to be able to get a better throughput of people and hopefully decrease those wait times. I mean, I, I, it's probably pie-in-the-sky idea to get it down to the 18 weeks, but hopefully it should improve. Uh, that's my hope anyway. I think that's the best take we can do on it, is no one seems particularly happy to use Charing Cross. Um, so it's going to get moved, and perhaps this scare, this alarm will help them realise they've got to plan it properly and they can't leave people waiting, they can't leave people misinformed, they can't leave people uninformed. So other than the actual, oh my god it's closing, that hopefully everyone's aware it's not closing, um, yeah. this might do good. I think it was an interesting microcosm, wasn't it, into the whole, um, I mean those of us and I, I, I that's the gender identity clinic that I go to, so you know, it's an interesting microcosm of their ad the way the whole thing worked so you know I think it was at mid-afternoon um, the news broke uh, there was a press release from the West London Mental Health Trust um, saying that um, it was it didn't say explicitly it was closing but um, it scared people and then, then there was some slightly irresponsible journalism um, yeah that said, yeah that said it was closing um, and then shortly after that one of the clinicians Stuart Lorimer said categorically it's not closing so that allayed some of the fears and the West London Mental Health Trust said it wasn't working and this all happened within the space of sort of two and a half hours um, and since since then same clinician has, has written an article for Huffington Post saying yeah you know, this is, was really quite dodgy journalism and I, I wonder if if that's an interesting point here is that, that is it is it the desire for a headline is it I don't know but it was I think you know, one of the things Stuart Lorimer said is that this sort of careless journalism could genuinely have a body count, uh, which is quite a serious thing. But I, I think I tweeted that not long after. You know, it, it really could have. Um, At best, it was a grossly oversimplified headline. Um, but at worst, it, it was, well, ignoring the motive uh, as to why it was not as accurate as it, as it could have been. Um, at worst, it was... Uh, the inaccuracy was in a very dangerous area. It wasn't just a small detail. It was you know, a, a very, very big difference between continuing to, to operate and not continuing. That, that's quite a big difference, uh, quite a big detail to get wrong. And the press release doesn't even say anything about the service being uh, moving geographically, although we can probably assume that eventually it will. It's on a slightly different in London, one would assume. Um, but it didn't even say that, and, and, there's, uh, and that's very much the... The angle that one gets out of the Gay Star News article is it's going to close. People might have to go somewhere else, and uh, obviously, for a lot of people, including I, I believe everyone in Wales, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. So everyone in Wales gets referred to Charing Cross um, as a you don't get a choice, basically. Even just people. This could be a lovely opportunity to split it up. We could have a jig in Wales, one in Brighton, and one in London. Well, I've long had a bit of a bugbear about this actually because um, I. I live in the southeast, and the closest GIC, the, well, the closest GIC to the southeast, other than Charing Cross, is there's Daventry. I suppose that not many people are aware of. But, but after that, you're going as far as Nottingham or Exeter, and you know. So if you, I know there's meant to be this this market process where you, if you don't want to go to Charing Cross, and a lot of people don't want to go to Charing Cross because it's got this reputation of a very long waiting list. In actual fact, it's not really any longer than the other ones now, and shorter than some of them, although well, still longer than some of them as well. Um, if you don't want to go to Charing Cross, you've got, if, and say you live um, Hampshire, Hertfordshire, or, or Sussex, or something, you've got a hell of a commute to go to another GIC, whereas you know, other areas of the country do have a, a genuine geographical choice, and not all of them do. I mean, so areas of Scotland, there's, there's no GICs for hundreds of miles, but it's. It, I think you're absolutely right in that it would be a great opportunity to, to split it up. I think clearly you have to have one in London, it's a, it's a population centre, but yes, Brighton would be an obvious choice. Um, you know, you could argue. Well, would, yeah. Um, yeah, again, um, Norfolk, Suffolk, there's, there's nothing up there, so maybe somewhere like Cambridge. Um, 
you've got uh, Reading, Reading, Swindon, Swindon in particular, there's another one where there's this dearth of geos, isn't it? It's far from geographically equal at the moment, yeah. It really isn't, though. Um, but, and actually, yeah, there's, there's a good point should be made on social media. So there isn't a GRC in the northwest at all. So, you know, the, the second biggest population centre in the country doesn't have one either. So it's, it, it really doesn't make a great deal of sense. I, I'm not fully au okay with how the system has grown up over the years, but it seems a real opportunity to, to fix something. Um, so if we're positive from our work, uh, there's a few positives that we could take from this, and we've touched on it already, but, you know, what, what else could we think of that, Let's try and be, put a nice spin on it. What, what good could come out of it? They might hire some admin people to answer the phone. Yeah. They well, might, you never know. Less than six months to get a send. Uh, that, I think that the most recent letter I had was, was I think, around six months. So if they can improve on that, that'd be great. Yeah, my last one was I could add, pretty add something in here, actually, about huh? a positive point. So there are investments in funding. People are getting frightened that... NHS funding's tight and things being cut, but a good example is the, the Glasgow GIC, Sandyford, have invested in new member of staff. They've got a much higher throughput now, and they're pushing people through a lot faster, and these waiting lists are coming down. Mm -hmm. So, I have competitive to say, end, Sorry? Yeah, so I was just going to say, yeah, last time I, I was at Charing Cross a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I certainly did get the impression, and I was quite optimistic, that things were improving. Um, although, until I've actually got the paperwork out of that that I'm hoping for, which I'm still waiting for, it's hard to say. Uh, but say, given that they're starting from such a poor position, it's not presumably too hard to improve. It's, it's a low bar to aim for. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, well, I think we might touch on it a little bit earlier, um, but it's it's moving away from being under a mental health trust, which, you know, fits with um, recent sort of... Um, guidelines, the global guidelines about not having gender services under mental health. It's not a mental health condition. So, you know, it's a potential to move in the right direction there, which I guess, which I guess is positive. Um, it would be interesting to see what this means in terms of um, commissioning of services and so on, whether it might start to become easier, I don't know, to access some of the other services that, you know, we know, for example, that we've got a um, different parts of the country, you can access different services. So in Scotland, for example, you can access some, some, some other surgeries that you can't access in England on the NHS. Um, various parts of England, you can access um, things like breast augmentation sometimes, whereas some you can't at all. Um, so it would be interesting to see if it has um, any, any impact there as well. It would be interesting, yeah, I have to say, I, I have no particular, uh, I don't think I've seen anything to suggest that that would happen. I mean, maybe uh, maybe Charlotte has some better insight into this, because she seems more familiar with NHS workings. Uh, but, yeah, I, I would, at best, I think it, it, it could well improve uh, the efficiency and, and type of care that um, possible offer. Um, there are more systematic problems with... Uh, gender care in general, in, in particular to do with uh, evenness of service and transparency, which I don't see that this will probably solve at all, I'm a part of thought. Yeah. Well, Charlotte, did you have a point on that? Um, well, I, I can hopefully foresee efficiency improving. I'm not sure about changing access to services. I mean, that's that's for those that run these services to decide. But yeah, there are differences across the country, but I don't think I could comment on whether a new tender for Charing Cross will say, well, well now you've got access to services you wouldn't otherwise have access to. I, I would be surprised, to be honest. I, I can't see them doing anything at the moment in the current climate. Anything that costs them more money is is, is not going to happen. If anything, extra stuff is going to be taken off the other tricks. Well, it would be nice to just get easier access to the services that we can get access to at the moment, so yeah. I guess that would be a nice start. I, I did see rumblings last week of um, is, is this a way of transferring it more towards private sector by the back door. Um, I would love to think that's untrue. I, I have no idea whether it is in any way true what at all, but obviously I very much hope it isn't. Yeah, I mean clearly ideologically, um, I would be uncomfortable with it, with it um, being, um, even if it was a public-private partnership or something, it's not something that I'm a fan of. Um, 
Oh yeah, you can imagine like a private hospital that perhaps offers surgery being very interested in hosting it. Into the sales opportunities. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> also bought them. Of course, a cynic might suggest that um, you know uh, buildings or um, floor space in that area of London is reasonably um, valuable. So I don't know what whether they might be able to make some money out of uh, freeing that up. But that might be one reason it might be out of London. But uh, you know, my understanding, anyway, is that. Um, it's probably just going to move as a going concern to another provider at the minute, and then they might move in a different strategic direction. I don't know if anyone knows anything different, um, but that was my understanding, certainly. I wonder, uh, I just see on uh, on Twitter uh, uh, someone saying about uh, the, the, the move of the service away from uh, you know, the, the mental health banner, if you like. Uh, now, in some ways, as I think, uh, as the Trust have already said, or sorry, as the GIC have already said, um, this is a, a good thing because you know most of the clients going there are do not have mental health problems, uh, so it's more appropriate to to have it as a you know, a gender um, facility as opposed to a mental health facility. On the other hand, of course, some people who, who go there do have mental health problems. Now, I'm I'm not one of them. I'm, I'm happy to say, uh, but I do wonder whether uh, such people is there a risk that they may. Uh, find it harder to access the mental health aspect of the services which they previously have access? That's an interesting point. Mm. Yeah, because why do you, at the moment my reading of the situation is that people find it hard to access those services through the GIC as it is anyway mm. um, because either they don't feel comfortable discussing that because they think it might otherwise um, affect their treatment. So. Yeah. That's, that's my experience. When I was going through it and I was getting depressed, I, I didn't say anything. I didn't want them to, because the only tool they've got is to delay you. Yeah, quite that's what it felt like. So I kept kept quiet. Yeah. Okay. I must say I, oh, I'm sorry. I must I must say I downplayed some of my depression and dysphoria at my appointment yesterday. Actually, I don't tell them they might be they might be watching. They might be watching. <laughs> <laughs> is it the same at the other GICs across the UK, that, that, that they are um, under mental health ban? Good question. Question for uh, Lisa and Charlotte, who are under, or have been under. Uh, I'm not sure, because I think the Glasgow one, it's it's in a sexual health clinic. But I'm, uh, as far as I know, it's just like Glasgow and Greater, uh, Glasgow and Greater Clyde, um, I mean, do you know anything about it? Um, it's um, basically the Sandiford is within, it's known as a, a sexual health clinic, but it's also a gender clinic and a gender identity clinic out with that, obviously. Um, but it kind of gets meshed in with that, but they run separately from the sexual health site. Basically, it's split into the way that I look at the hospital, which I've been going to for a number of years. Um, it's split into there's the sexual health side of things, and then there's a separate, different clinic just for the gender identity issues and counselling and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that prints, but I've kind of went off point. Sorry, didn't go. Really <laughs> but I think there's, <laughs> I mean, the psychiatrists, so there's still mental health, but I don't think it's actually run by a mental health trust and I couldn't really comment on the other other GICs. Sheffield's very similar, it's in, it's, it shares the building with sexual health but it's it's not a mental health trust yeah. that runs it so yeah. I think that's the new model. Hopefully. Okay well it sounds like we've pretty much kind of done that topic now. Uh, so so one, uh, it doesn't look like, unfortunately, our Q and A is working, which is really frustrating. So, if you want to get in contact, we really like to get some input from you. Um, so, if you want to get in contact with us, if you want to ask us some questions. Doesn't have to be related to any of the topics we're discussing. If there's something else you want to discuss, uh, then tweet us, uh, said at, under, at n underscore g e n d r, um, or Facebook us. We're um, uh, on Facebook. Just search for Agenda um, and. and Post us some messages that way. We'd really like to get some messages from you. We've had a couple during this, which we've kind of woven into the conversation seamlessly. Um, 
Um, we think we've got a fix for why the Q and A isn't, isn't working. So sorry about that. But uh, there's some changes I think that are going to take place before we do the next one, which I um, think will fix it. Um, so let's move on to our next topic, um, which is uh, the again the news that many of you probably would have seen this week and will have frustrated you uh, probably to your core, uh, which is that once again um, a trans character, a trans woman character is going to be played by a cis male actor. Um, this is the film Anything, uh, which is going to be uh, directed by Mark Ruffalo uh, and actor um, Matt Bomer is going to be playing a transgender woman sex worker um, who enters into a relationship with a, with a cis man uh, in this film. So, Lisa, what can we say about this one? Well, we're here again, aren't we? It's just like Aren't they tired of this? It's a cis man playing a trans woman. I mean, it just reinforces the public perception that trans women are really men. That there's a deception going on, and it's it's just tiresome. They need to stop doing this. It's another brave role for a man. It's not brave. It's stealing roles from trans women. There's brilliant trans actors and actresses out there and they need to be getting these roles and this is counterproductive and harmful to our community and it needs to stop and I don't understand why it's still happening. I don't. I really don't. There was a quote from, from, um, from Mark Ruffalo, I think on, on that article on the uh, Big Gay Picture Show website saying, I'm very happy to be part of this daring project. What way is this daring? I don't get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I saw on Twitter someone saying, it's not brave to play a trans woman. What's brave is playing our lovers. And that's the roles they should be going for. That's the roles. That's the Oscar bait. That's the new Oscar bait. Not playing a trans woman. Get off. Stop doing it. We should protest every opening night. So I think this is an interesting one because absolutely, I mean, I was very much, so, and you know, you spoke really well about that, Lisa. It's 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 so frustrating that this keeps happening. But there's a couple of points um, that that I think are interesting. Let's tackle the the perhaps less controversial one first. So one is why are these? I think we know why these why are these actors taking these roles, um, and why are they not being offered to trans women, and what do we think? Why, why is this happening? <laughs> is it? Sorry, sir. Yeah, it's, it's so frustrating. I, th I don't know if which came first, the audience reaction or the, the script writer. Um, this is trying to pander to people's media, public, old-fashioned perception. This is trying to go for the the, the shock of the transition, the the shock of the reveal, the oh, what genitals have they got? And it's I like, think that's oh. actually in the film, is it? From what I saw, the script segment. I think there I saw is, something. Yes, yeah. yeah, from the, the script excerpts we've seen. I was trying to imagine um, uh, inserting that same sort of segment of script into other well-known films. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of examples of well-known cis, you know, cis het films. Um, and inserting that sort of segment at the end, and just just by way of comparison, just seeing how inappropriate it would be. Something. Yeah. So one of my favourite films, for example, is When Harry Met Sally, which is a wonderful, you know, rom rom com or whatever you want to call it. Um, and and then the, the the closing scenes in the film is sort of after Harry and Sally told their story, and, and they're sitting together, sort of on a, on a sofa, being interviewed, basically, and they're saying, and so we finally got together, and and that, and uh, she, she gets into the, the joke about the. Um, about food and preparation and so forth. But you can just imagine, you know, the, the couple gets together and they're really in love, blah, blah, blah. And then he turns to her and then says, So show us your genitals then. That, that, <laughs> that people would just recognise in that context that that was completely inappropriate. But for some reason, in, uh, you know, as soon as one of the characters is trans, it's for some reason not flagged up by everyone as being wrong, which is very unhelpful and disappointing at very least. It could add a lot to uh, some Jane Austens, yeah. My <laughs> yeah. Darcy. Oh my, oh my Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, 
I know, I'm just, all I can think of now is various themes from film. I know, scenes from films exactly that would be, yeah. If you ever needed to say, why, why this is such a bad thing, then just take other films and just splice in the same badness into those well-known films that people love. Um, you know, Casablanca and, and whatever else there is, you know, all, all these wonderful romantic films, and then just insert the gentle scene at the end. It's great. The other scene we've got in this anything, can you guess? It's the trans woman putting on makeup. Oh, of course. Did you forget that one? That's the drinking game. Apparently, it's about four or five times seen. Perhaps a little wig. Who knows? Oh, yes, because, of course, you know, um, we, we spend all our time putting on wigs and makeup. That's, that's what we're about, of course. Doing it right now. Yeah. So. If this film does seem to, tro uh, to do a trot out. Pretty much all of the uh, of the trans drinking bingo games. And I'd like to think that this is why uh, Lisa's the only one of us who hasn't got wine here this evening, just to protect her from deep in the bingo overload. <laughs> I had to do as a water drinker. I mean, my frustration here is I mean, this is you know, this is Eddie Redmayne, this is Jared Leto all over again, wanting they want you know this brave performance for an Ox Oscar. Um, and you know, often we're told that there aren't any suitable trans actresses, um, in this case it would be an actress, uh, to, to, to play these roles. And I mean, maybe 15 years ago there was some merit in that, but there are now, you know, some some trans actresses with with a, with a very good profile of their own. I mean, you know, obvious ones like Vern Cox and Jamie Clayton, but there are people that have, you know, <sighs> Is Matt is Matt Bomer a big name? Am I am I sort of disconnected from the world now? I, I hadn't heard he of was, him prior to this. He was in this. this thing called White Collar. Oh, there's a boxing film, wasn't it? No, no, no. It's was a series. It? Based oh, on I don't know. Crappy <laughs> criminal that does some work for the FBI. It's a really cheesy garbage. Fest. He's just basically uh, cleaning and this is the hotel. I don't know who you've it. Even ignoring the. the Talent pool of, of trans um, sorry, Rachel go. So even ignoring that the, the talent pool of trans um, actors being overlooked, um, they still chose an ACIS man in preference to a cis woman to play yeah. a woman's role. Yeah. So, so it is you know, well, in what way could it possibly be worse? They chose an assist boy? I mean I mean it, it, it's hard to think how they could possibly choose someone that's more ill-suited. Yeah, um, it's true. And you know, in this event, you know, at least with Eddie Redmayne and Jared Leto, we had them, you know, pretending to engage with the community and trying to understand what they were playing. But this guy is just blocking people <laughs> and not listening. You know, it just seems to be very, very unnerving. Um, so there was a second point that I wanted to get to, and this is something I've noticed over watching reactions to this film, um, but also to previous ones, so particularly The Danish Girl, um, which is that there seems to be this very serious split within um, the trans community. There are a significant number of people that think this is absolutely fine uh, and think that this is, you know, provided that they are the best actor, for that I use the actor in the slightly disingenuous, um, non-gender specific way, which I don't necessarily agree with, the best person for the job, um, it doesn't matter whether they're trans or not. Um, and I just wonder why we think that might be. Um, I mean, clearly, clearly we're not a homogenous mass, we're not going to have the same opinions, but there is this significant group that really don't think that this is a problem. Why, maybe we should speculate to us to why. Well, I suppose it is the telling of a trans story. There is a trans character in a Hollywood film. Um, we do exist now. They've noticed us. But it, it's never going to be represented right. It, no matter how good he is, he's going to miss something. He's going to over-focus on the clothes or the, the hair, the makeup, the whole thing. It's an act. He's not going to understand where he's coming yeah. from. Is it all bad? No, it's not. But but there are there is far more bad here than good. Yeah, you know, there, there is a trans character, but uh, but yeah, you know, there there is this focus on 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 content that, that shouldn't be there. It's played by an inappropriate uh, a bad choice of actor. Um, 
and, and I believe that the character is, uh, if I remember correctly, a sex worker, which yep. is a you know, true uh, bingo card, here we go. Yep. Can I have a point here, actually? Absolutely. So, not necessarily, and I agree with this, but it's like, you get actors for jobs. <laughs> Are you saying he'll miss certain things about the role? And, and that's very true. But it's like, I don't know, take any story, any actor in any story, they're playing a scientist. They're not a scientist, they're going to miss some things about being a scientist. They're playing a criminal and not a criminal, they're going to miss some things about being a criminal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, it's, it's a role, and I suppose the job of the person's like, obviously they failed to cast someone who can do this role much more effectively but the casting's done so I mean his job now is to represent who he's playing appropriately unfortunately he's failing to do that by blocking anyone <laughs> it's actually going to be worth worth talking to about this which is which is a bad thing but the point is it's like acting is acting and it's never going to be perfect. I mean, I see scientists, I mean, I'm a scientist, represented atrociously. It's like, that's not what a scientist is. Um, but the sad thing is, it's like, well, if a scientist is misrepresented, it's usually not very dangerous. If a trans person is misrepresented, again, as a man pretending, then there's this trope that goes on that we are all men pretending and that can actually lead to a lot of danger and violence. The biggest problem here I think is not um, the um, the fact that there may be um, incomplete incompletely perfect acting. Uh, the biggest problem is the casting, you know, the, the gender of the cast member involved um, and I suspect the content of the script, the, the sex worker, the inevitable, and I'm going to say it because it will be there, the, the makeup and the wig and all this sort of stuff and, and the, the big reveal with the genitals at the end. Now, no amount of wonderful acting can, can paper over those problems. Mm -hmm. No, it's just going to be a stereotype, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Ken Richards made the point on Twitter that it's, it's going to lead to violence because anything that perpetuates the myth that we're really men is, is going to lead to more violence. There's trans women trying to date people and Oh no, I've seen it on TV. I've seen it on a movie. Yeah. And it's just dangerous. What? And we should stop it. So, so Olivia, what, did you have something to say? No? Sorry, what do we know about the movie so far? Because we don't know. I, 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 I can tell you right now, this is the first time I've heard of it. So, do we know it's going to be a gender stereotype? Do we, do we know the plot line, apart from it being a sex worker? But most trans movies tend to be about sex work because it is a, a problem. And, our community that needs to be addressed and be focused on, which I'm, I'm quite glad that they're doing that. So, but, okay. it, but do we know it's going to be a bad set of type, or he may actually do a good job? It's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, so <laughs> we um, so we know some we know some of the plot line because there's been a, a press release. So we know that it is a story of a. I think it's a, it's a cis man who has split up with a, what's that, a cis female partner, um, and he's it's one of these odd couple stories where he ends up dating this um, trans woman who's a sex worker, and uh, I, I assume it's some sort of well, probably not quite hilarity issues, but you know, um, it sounds like it's a, a, then a struggle for their acceptance of each other and people's acceptance of them. So um, we've, yeah, I and mean, there's been a few stills released and a few little bits of plot released, which with the bits we've talked about. So it doesn't sound great, but then I guess, and you know, this is a good point you made, is that actually perhaps these might be some, well, two points I, I thought of from this. These might be those sort of snippets might be the things that that are that a, um, a company might release because to the wider public they might sound a bit you know um, salacious and interesting but also actually you know they've got enough experience of this now to, to know that this is the sort of thing that elicits a bit of controversy and actually controversy can be good um, it gets us talking about it would we be talking about this film otherwise almost certainly not so so maybe there is the cynic in me this maybe there is something there so, so it's a good the wider public are going to care whether it's a trans person or a cis no. person 
playing that role. I don't. That is an issue that needs to be addressed separately. But these movies are being made. That's good. That's a positive. People are going. Let's make movies about these these people's stories and get them out there because these stories do exist. These their sex workers being exploited all over the world who are only being exploited because they're trans. That's the story we should be actually talking about. Who yeah. cares who plays a part? There's people who are being exploited in the world right now who are sex workers that are being used by, and they don't have a voice. Who cares who who gives a voice? They're having a voice. If it's a badly made movie, we'll talk about that after the movie's been made. We don't know if it's a bad movie because this movie hasn't even been filmed yet. But it's getting made. That's an important point. But that can be true to an extent about the, um, you know, it, it is someone's story, as you say, um, and, and let's assume that that's true, uh, that it does accurately re represent someone's story. However, there, there, could, there is still a risk, even if you do that, of um, of making too many films which emphasize on, uh, too much emphasis on one particular kind of story. And therefore, uh, okay, yes, so films as a whole don't reflect reality, but the breadth of characters you see in regular, you know, uh, films about cis people is quite wide, whereas there is a risk that, um, that you, know, you might end up making, a, every time you make a film including a trans character, it always focuses on the same angle, and therefore you're, you're focusing um, attention unnecessarily uh, and, uh, and painting a very unrepresentative picture of trans people as a whole, not just in that one film, but across the, the breadth of the films that you make, or the lack of breadth, I should say. Do we think this is kind of indicative of a wider issue where actually various oppressed or minority groups and so on aren't, rep aren't represented in Hollywood properly? You know, we hear from, for example, people with disabilities or whatever that, that say um, that roles in Hollywood films are being played by able-bodied actors and they're not they're not necessarily representing them very well. Is is it just that because we're trans, we're focusing on that part of the issue, but actually it's a wider issue with representing diversity in Hollywood or outside of Hollywood, but in films. Is it any worse for us, or is it is it just a general issue? I think for the most part, I would I would agree. I mean, it, 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 it's um, I was thinking yes, disabled people would have a very similar um, concern um, in in that. Um, you know, it, it's quite rare to have, yeah, well, to, to flip it around, it's, it's all too common to have a disabled character in a film whose story is their disability, as opposed to they just happen to be disabled. There are some exceptions, but um, but it, it's, I'm sure um, we would much rather the things were evened out a bit on that sense. Um, and yes, you do get the form of non-disabled people um, playing a disabled character, which therefore potentially takes away a job from somebody else. However, the big difference with uh, with that compared to trans people is when you see a, um, well, at least I assume, um, disabled people, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if, if people see a, an able-bodied person playing a disabled character in a movie, they don't therefore come away with the impression that all disabled people are liars uh, and are faking it and, and worthy of abuse. And that, I think, is very much the case with trans people. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, one final point we should say is that um, do we think that that tra the trans people are, are getting any opportunity at all? You know, are they getting? Um, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Um, you know, I know that um, I've forgotten her surname, but Jen, who was in her story, Rich. said she Jen definitely yes auditioned for this role, didn't get it. Um, but we are seeing more trans people perhaps now. And actually, are we seeing trans people being able to play roles that, I don't want to say the character is cis, but where the character's um, gender identity doesn't matter. So roles where you know a trans woman playing a woman who is a woman, it doesn't matter whether she's cis or trans because that's not the story. Um, or, or a non-binary person playing someone for whom their gender isn't relevant to the story, so it doesn't matter. You know, is that starting to happen? Has anyone seen any evidence of that? I think that that comes into, a, again, a wider issue of... That comes about to writing. People need to write stories that gender doesn't matter for 
actors to play the roles where gender doesn't matter. At the moment, we're not there. We're never. I don't know if we'll ever be there because Hollywood or people, even in, in British drama, it's all about gender stereotypes and playing roles and stuff like that. And that's that's about when we need to win. It comes down to basic gender roles and breaking stereotypes and getting away from writing stories that are based on gender alone. Like a nurse always has to be a female, blah, blah, blah. This all goes on. It's very, it, it seems to be controversial when there's a male nurse on a, a TV drama, et cetera, et cetera, which is really kind of a basic level, but gender stereotypes need to be broken before you can look at trans roles. And then it comes down to if a trans woman plays a, a cis character, then she gets accused of attempting to pass or be stealth, and then that goes on, and she has to take that backlash on board, and that's a whole that that's that's unfair and unnecessary. But that's what you're you, that's what you do to cis people. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I think we're all done on that topic. So thank you. Um, so once again, I'll reiterate: uh, if anyone wants to, uh, we've had some good um, comments on that stories we've been talking about. If anyone wants to um, comment further on that, or, or go back to the, the earlier subject, or indeed ask us yeah. to talk about something completely different, then please give us a shout, tweet us. Um, we'll get the Q and A working for next time. <laughs> um, but our final story. Uh, that we that we were going to talk about tonight is about um, this story from the US, um, where we have a girl, a cis, a cis girl, um, who's claiming that uh, she'll, and I think this is a verbatim quote, will fail high school if trans students are treated with equality. I don't think that's a verbatim quote from her, to be clear, but it's a quote from the story. Um, so it's she's not happy, 13-year-old girl is not happy with trans students being able to use the changing room um, associated with the appropriate gender. Um, so she's saying she will refuse to uh, essentially have PE lessons um, whilst um, trans students are there. And I believe, and Charlotte, you may know better on this one, I don't know, but I believe this isn't in reaction to any specific trans student, so it's just a general comment that she just doesn't want to encounter us. Um, She's yeah. so, so the story is, this is a 13-year-old girl at high school. No trans students. Uh, there may be trans student in the school, but certainly not in her class. She has no direct interaction with any trans students. Uh, she is kind of part of an evangelical Christian um, group. Um, her mother is very proactive in the in these circles so actually I is probably a controversial opinion I actually feel sorry for the girl she's 13 she's impressionable she's been exposed to a very one-sided picture through her group and her mother's opinion I mean you read the read the posts and her mother's like oh I support my daughter fully she's come to this decision of her own accord but she's 13 she's I mean you, you, you've basically got two modes when you're 13 you either rebel or you are trying to aim to please and I think she's taken the view of aiming to please a very evil and evangelical mother I mean there was no mention of father so I, I can't comment on that so I'm, I'm not even sure she even may share this opinion. So I think the, the point here is about education. And I mean, this is an American story. I'm not very clued up on American initiatives. But certainly in this country, now that Section 28 is long gone, uh, there's the Thai campaign, the Time for Inclusive Education, which is about um, promoting uh, basically LGBT awareness in, in kids, is... Um, so basically, this this child, this thirteen year old girl, is is lacking this awareness and is jumping to an opinion that's basically going to please her parents. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on on the matter. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it sounds to me as though I think you've, you've probably nailed it there. It's, I mean, I've just been reviewing the story again now, and as far as I can understand, there really is no transgender students that this is a reaction to. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's no suggestion that there are any at the school. Um, so I don't, it's slightly baffling as to where this has come from. Um, yeah, I think it's just a case of wanting to, yeah, loudly fit in with the parents' views and, and, and I don't know, kind of make them proud almost. I can't, I can't see any other way to it. I mean, it's, you know, this this attitude is, is absolutely not used. We see this all the time. We see people saying these sorts of things. Um, you know, um, it's just it's. The reason it's so baffling is why why make a big song and dance about it when it doesn't even never happen. Perhaps it's the environment in America at the moment with um, the fuss about um, uh, where, where's that state down south where they're um, trying to prevent trans people using the right, the right bathroom. Oh, um, South Carolina. One of the Carolinas. Yeah, South Carolina. North Carolina. It's yeah. about putting your colours to the mast, about saying you're either for us or you're against us. And the thing a lot of Christians seem to be against is the image of us and what they think we are and what they've been told we are. And perhaps if this girl and her mother actually met a trans person or one that wasn't frightened to meet them or admit they were trans, um, their attitude might change. It's just the idea that transgender people exist is just like outside their comprehension at the moment and so we're just asking to them to believe in something that they have no physical proof of and you know you think it Christians would be able to get the hang of that but I think it's, it's very likely to, to be to be true what, what you said about lack of exposure to uh, to people of a certain class does um, make it very hard to um, to, to, to accept and understand that that group of people, um, I was I, I admit I was quite similar myself when I was um, much 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 younger. Um, before I knew, we were in a very white village, so I um, had some what I would now say deeply problematic views about non-white people. Um, but guess what? I didn't know any white non-white people at the time, and as soon as I did, those views went away. Um, and so, I, and I, I've seen that pattern amongst other people as well. So I think that's very likely to be the case if you don't know any trans people. And, and as as we said, there are no uh, in this particular story, there are no trans people in this girl's class. Um, then you are left with your own um, own, own preconceptions, your own uh, prejudices, and nothing to guide and correct that. No reality to to hold it in balance. It just goes to show the importance of education, doesn't it? And, you know, Creating a space or a, or a way in, in schools for people to, I mean, you know, in, in tiny little southern American towns, I'm sure there probably aren't many trans or gay people or, or even people of colour. But you know, it's if we teach people about um, other identities and, and you know different backgrounds, then people will be more comfortable. With that I think mean, that that's entirely right. It's interesting that even without that sort of uh, check, checks and balances, the reality could could apply in the present sense of actual. Uh, real trans people, um, that the, the viewpoints that this this girl and or her mother are uh, putting forward are probably quite far uh, out of whack with what they would otherwise reasonably say. Um, quote from here, I feel nothing against transgender people, um, I would just not like their rights to overall mine. Yes. So, oh, why would you say that about any other kind of person? Like, so, what is, but I've got to win. It's a wonderfully revealing quote, isn't it? Because it's 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 saying that you know she is literally, well, figuratively saying that she thinks her right to not have to encounter a transgender person trumps a transgender person's right to a full education and the use of the correct, the appropriate change rooms. And you know, if we've come down to that, then that. It should be an attitude that's easily sold, but unfortunately it doesn't seem to yeah, be. Great. She doesn't particularly qualify what specific what she's talking about in, in the quote that I'm looking at anyway, but it is, it, at the level of detail I'm seeing, it's just, my rights are more important than your rights. Yes. Or I'm fighting not even your rights, a fictional person's rights. Very animal farm. Now, I wonder if we're... Sorry, Sorry go on, Charlotte, before I... Just a strange thing on. here is this... 
they don't actually know their own religion all that well. <laughs> There's, there's nowhere in the Bible where it says being trans is wrong. In fact, it doesn't even mention it at all. And presumably, they're like by being Christian, it's Jesus is the Son of God, etc. And they're New Testament readers. Jesus was, by their by their own book, was an engaging, friendly, open, loving person, and would accept anyone and everyone. So. In his time, we'd probably be best friends with Jesus. And it's just like, they just don't understand. It's like Christianity is not about hate, it's about love. And it just puzzles me to no end. I, I think it's time for a New Testament anyway. It's been too long since the last Testament. It's, it's getting like half life. It's like we've had the, you know, we've had everyone bangs on about Testament one and Testament two. We need Testament three. That's the problem here. You know, they've been promising this update for ages and ages and ages. It's never happened. Where is it? Natalie, chapter one, verse one. Well, three. you know, I, I, I am the, the queen of everything. So. Of everything. <laughs> so I wonder actually if, if, I wonder if we're overlooking at probably a, a relevant point here, which is actually that, you know, um, may have noticed that they're going to have uh, a bit of a, a bit of a vote in the US in a couple of months, two, three months. And they're a big fan over there of these so-called wedge issues, um, which typically take the shape of something that the Republican Party like to find that slightly conservative Democrats aren't comfortable with. Um, so they want to find something that they can make, that they can try and force Democrats to support that will alienate their slightly more conservative base. So you're that you're going to get things like Black Lives Matter, you're going to get trans rights, things that the right leaning end of and I know the right left dichotomy is much more complicated than that anyway, but you know, that the the more conservative Democrats might think, well, do you know what, you know, I'm not really comfortable voting for, for trans rights or, 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 or black people's rights, so I'm gonna vote for Trump. And I wonder if this is a little bit of that. Scary. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out anyway, because I'm going to America next week. So if I come back, then things will be fine. Um, you better come back. <laughs> so I guess that pretty much uh, winds things up for this week. Um, so thanks again to Rachel Evans. Goodbye. Thanks to Lisa Seven. Hi. Thanks to Charlotte and Carol. Thank you. And to Olivia. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and if you want to get in touch with us, then I've given you the Twitter account several times. Get in touch with us on Facebook. We're still really looking for people to get involved with gender and write stuff for us, make videos, make art, all sorts of stuff. We want people of all identities. We, don't, we want trans women, we want trans men, we want non-binary people, we want um, trans people with disabilities, we want trans people of colour, we want neurotypical trans people, non-binary people, we want everybody, you know, get in touch with us. We want to put your stuff out there. Um, but until next time, we'll probably do this again in two weeks. I might not be here because I'll be in America, but somebody will be hopefully. Um, if you've got ideas for topics you want us to discuss, please do get in touch and we'll hopefully get the Q&A working next time. Um, but that's it. Um, enjoy transfer deadline day. Uh, Joe Hart's gone on loan to Torino, uh, but he'll be back and so will we in a couple of weeks. So thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.